are interested in coming. Uh, we're, I'm uh, Sami, and I'm a representative of 100 Students for Sustainability. And we're the organization that uh, uh, organizes these lectures. Uh, today, we have the prominent pleasure of having Johanna Georgi here from uh, Tillväxtverket, uh, which is the Swedish agency for regional and uh, uh, regional growth and development. Uh, and we have uh, a professor in environmental economics, Thomas Stanner, here. Uh, and they're going to talk about, hello, welcome, uh, uh, about sustainable growth. Uh, and uh, HAS, or Handel Student for Sustainability, we're a student organization uh, that, okay, that uh, try to facilitate uh, discussion uh, and uh, uh, yeah, like inspiration regarding uh, growth and uh, and uh, within the economic field and uh, like sustainability in general throughout uh, law and economics. So uh, we're re very pleased to have someone here, and we are actually uh, looking for uh, people to get engaged in our association. Uh, so if you're interested in our association, we will. Uh, uh, you can talk to me or uh, some of the other people that are the board today uh, after the lecture, and we'll be happy to to uh, talk about it. We have some places left in the board if somebody's interested. And not, it's not so much work. Also, we um, uh, also we have uh, uh, this is a lunch seminar, so we will have uh, uh, sandwiches. Uh, they're a bit late, so we'll have it after the seminar is over and. Uh, uh, I guess we only have 40, so uh, you who have received tickets, uh, please keep them, and then yeah, we'll you can trade them in for a for a sandwich. Uh, you uh, yeah, the people not having sandwiches, unfortunately, we can't uh, help you. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Johanna. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was a bit sort of terrified to arrive at B44 and see due to great demand and move the lecture. So. Anyway, um, I'm working for, as uh, Sami is it? Sami said, um, for the Swedish, I need to check it out, Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth. There we go. Tilbex uh, Verk, it's much easier in Swedish. So the Agency for Growth, more or less. Um, we're uh, an agency uh, underneath the Ministry for uh, Economic Enterprise, Energy and Communication, or as we say in Swedish, Nadings Department. So uh, my top boss would, would then be Anilö, somewhere along the line. And our mission is not to, well, with our name, you would say that we're working for growth in general, um, but we're just limited to facilitating entrepreneurship and also working for regional development. Uh, in the process right now to decide with our new general director what that actually actually means. Uh, so more about that in, uh, in spring probably. Um, so I'm working in the development department of Tilbex Um That means I'm working with, uh, with the responsibility for um, sustainable growth as a concept, uh, as a strategy, uh, and uh, trying to develop like what, what do we think about it? How do we how do we look upon sustainable growth as a concept and how do we work with that to integrate that uh, in the organization and in our activities? So that's pretty much what I'm doing and that's also why I'm here today. Um, so I thought I might as well kick it off with the sort of the most essential question. And I prepared this lecture in um, Swedish. I don't even know if this is an expression in, in English or not, but you know about the elephant in the room. Yeah. So the elephant in the room would then be, so is eternal growth possible in a world of finite resources? What would you say? Have we got yes here? No. So we got, it's a no, yeah. Well then we agree that. I would also say I don't think that eternal growth is possible. Um, I don't think we'll hear much, I think we'll come there, we'll hear that from the public sector well, saying like, okay, so eternal growth is not a possibility. Um, at the same time, we as an agency have uh, deliberately chosen to work with sustainable growth as a concept. And so one might wonder how, how that comes about. It's like working within a possibility. Well, on one hand, one can say, well, the option was to change the name of the agency. And I've been working there for two years. And, and that was my first, like, during my first two months, I thought, well, why do we change the name of the agency? But that seemed to be a bit of a sort of far-hatched um, option. 
Uh, and I was thinking, well, like sustainable growth and how would you look upon it? Um, well, I'll try to start to explain sort of the background to uh, how I still say that we can work with sustainable growth as a concept. Um, three circles, I think you know what this is. Can anyone give me sort of one, one, one guess what this could be? Is it three pillars of sustainability? Exactly. So what would we, we put in these, in these circles then? Uh, social, economic and, and environmental. Exactly. So unless you're working within the finance industry and you're going to do uh, ECG reporting, uh, which is uh, economics, well, environmental, social and governance. But in this case, this is sort of like the Brundtland definition of sustainability. Uh, we're talking about three pillars. Uh, we have the economic side, the environmental side and the social side. This is all very well known. Um, but we have two major problems with this. Um, first one would be that these are not really connected, they're seen more or less as, as in opposition. Um, we um, have something called this, the, the, the dilemma of growth. Are you familiar with this? More growth, more environmental problems. Less growth, social problems. So what do we do? Uh, so that's one of the, the issues. Um, and they're not seen as equals, I would say. This is not how it's really looked upon. I mean, one way, on one hand, they're not connected. On the other hand, they're not really seen as equal. I would say the economy is usually the one that we sort of base our concept upon. It's like we talk about today about GDP, for example, as sort of the, um, the overall aim of, of politics. When you hear uh, prime ministers all around the world, when they speak, they usually speak about how the de development of GDP. And that's saying like a um, if that's a good grade or not of the politics. Um, so the economy, the economic the dimension takes center stage. Um, and what happens then is that we create something that looks more or less, that has been dubbed, and you see what it looks like, a Mickey Mouse economy. We have the um, economic side being so like, we're talking about this, it is going to be less or more growth. Um, what I would say is that when we have an economy like this, or when we have a view of sustainability like this, sustainability is about um, uh, diminishing um, the negative impact of the economy. So we're trying to get uh, enough growth to, to support sort of social development, but not too much to sort of uh, wreck the, um, the, environment, the environment. But I would say if, in order to speak about sustainable growth, um, it is not so much about limiting uh, the negative consequences, obviously that's one part of it, but it's definitely uh, more clearly about redefining growth as we see it, so the concept in itself. Um, so I would say the solution would then not be so much about more or less growth, but rather what do we want to grow and how do we want to do that. So bring, keeping in mind that still saying like, I don't think the eternal growth is a possibility. I still say that I think sustainable growth is still a concept that is useful to find a way, to find these ways and find this aspect that, um, that can, can sort of lead us into a more sustainable economy. Um, and obviously on the other hand also, if you want to speak with politicians, you want to talk to them, it's not really fruitful to go into like, I think we should have another economic system. I don't know what it looks like, but I think we should have another one. If you base it on growth, if we're in a system that is based on growth, it's also a fruitful way of actually getting the discussion going. It's like, how can we look upon, it, um, upon this in a different way? And what we would like to say then is that these uh, dimensions are more equal. And we've used this notion to develop this sort of model. So we've got the three. You know, we've got like, well, this is Swedish, but I think you, there won't be any problems with you understanding it. It's, the economic, economic side, the environmental side, the social side. But what's interesting is really what happens in these, uh, in these dimensions, in the intersections between economy and uh, the social side, or between environment and economy. What is it that we see happen there? Well, we know within economy we use this, we, we speak profit, we speak return on investment, um, GDP, taxes, number of jobs created, that sort of thing that we also ask people asking uh, our agency for funding. He was like, well, how many jobs are you going to create? Or um, 
how much will the turnover increase for the next for the next few years when you get this this funding. If you look at the social side, well, it's human rights. Uh, we we'll talk about integration, equality, health, uh, equal rights, and on the environmental side, we we'll speak about natural resources, biodiversity, emissions, waste, and pollution. For just a few examples. So then the question, how do we get these to work together? What can we, using this model, can we identify pathways that we think lead to a more sustainable economy? <coughs> if we look in the sort of inclusive growth, we, we dubbed inclusive growth, um, just taking the sort of uh, term that we repeated, I think, from the EU using this. I don't even think we're using it the same way they do, but that's still, this is what we call it. Um, we can see that uh, an inclusive growth is about diversity. Diversity is, a, is essential to inclusive growth. It's about actually making sure, I mean, in the economy today, I think 75% of all the entrepreneurs in Sweden are men. Uh, and why is that? Uh, and we speak about how many, how, when we look at age differences, or we look at people with different backgrounds, or we look at different types of organizations, because we see more and more organizations working like social entrepreneurs. Um, the type of organization that we see, the people running them, we see another type of entrepreneurs growing in Sweden. And this is what we call social innovation, social entrepreneurships. Um, we can also speak about SROI. Is there anyone who knows what that stands for? It's not that difficult. Social return on investment. <laughs> so it's not. Um, it's only a whole new way to measure impact of projects or companies. So instead of just Counting us like okay, so how much, um, how 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 much will the return on investment increase in the next years? It's more about like what impact will you have? So it's it changes the way you ask the question. Just think about in the um, if if you look into the debate that has been on um, within uh, healthcare, if you would ask the question like instead of like how cheap can you do it and that, or like how well, can you take care of these people? There's a whole different meaning of like how you actually uh, tend to that type of, of enterprises. Um, within the environmental side, we've been used to speaking about the that the sustainable way of doing business would be that we speak about doing it in a more res resource efficient way, or it would be more uh, renew renewable resources or clean tech is quite popular. Clean tech is usually the one that's like, yeah, that's the solution. We've got a whole new business area where. We can actually grow on the economic side and at the same time we can solve the environmental problems. But clean tech is quite a small business area. So what's more interesting when we speak on the environmental side, seeing these sort of uh, bigger trends that actually change the way you do business. Um, where there has been this view of take, make, dispose. So like, a, you know, the sort of linear economy where you have uh, you to sell more products, the most products as ever possible. Uh, and then just get rid of them and to get a new one. So you've got your phone, it's not supposed to last more than two, three years even. I don't even think that, two maybe. And it's supposed to break down. Because you're supposed to want a new one. I mean, sometimes it doesn't even have to break down. It's just like, we add an S to that model. <laughs> and oh, everyone wants a new one. Um, and moving that to you know, uh, another type of, of economy, well, I'm sure you've heard about the sort of circular economy instead, where it's more about reducing um, the resources we're using, but also reusing them and then finally recycling them. And that also, other trends that are within this area is also that you change then the consumer to a user. So instead of consuming mobile phones, uh, maybe I'm just, I'm just using the service of having sort of a tool to, to place calls. Or, well, the good, the most used example is that on Spotify, instead of consuming CDs, I'm using the service to listen to music. So it's actually music from a product to a service. And we can see this in other areas as well. We see that in cars, you've got some clicking, you've got the sort of carpooling, become more and more popular. You see that in fashion, for example, there are a few, I would say the fashion industry is quite interesting because they're quite forward thinking in this area. I saw today that uh, H&M, they're just they're launching now in February their first uh, collection of jeans that have been to 20% still um, made by uh, reused fabrics that they collected through their uh, Don't Let Fashion Go to Waste initiative. So a few examples of just like trying to close the loop instead. 
Um, have we got this, the final one here also, um, where you speak about um, handling, so doing well, what, what is the area, where is the, um, the safe operating area? Uh, you can speak like you need, so like a, a, if I understand it uh, correctly, I think Thomas is going to speak more about planetary boundaries, but can also put a sort of social aspect to it. Um, and this is where you also speak on a moral macro level beyond GDP. So how do we how do we look upon uh, the economy when we just don't look at, at GDP? And I would say there's no wrong with GDP in itself. I mean, it has its lacks and everything. But I think from an economic side, as I spoke to a colleague of mine who's a uh, economic historian, if that's what we call them, and he said, well, you know, this is not strange. I mean, this is for any econo economist, this is sort of quite normal. You know the limits of the GDP. It's just like us people, like me, not being economists or politics, not being really economists either. They use it as something it was never meant to be. Um, and if it's going to be used as a, as a sort of measure on how um, the society is going or to evaluate the politics, it just doesn't fit. It's not enough. So you need to complement that with other indicators and so on. Um, so then the question is then for how do we as an agency work with this? It was just a quick tour on how we're trying to use this model to just sort of identify the different pathways that we say, okay, so this could be a way to go in order to, uh, to see a more sustainable economy without saying actually we know how it looks like, just trying to identify like where is it and want to go. Um, but for us it is about um, using this uh, notion uh, and concept of sustainable growth um, to use it to integrate it within the agency. On one hand, for example, last year, we had a lot of focus on doing this with diversity, where we said, if we as an agency, if our money just go to one specific group, and that would be the middle-aged uh, white men, obviously, um, what type of, what is it that we'll get in the end? There won't be any news in the end. There will be just more of the same. And what we're saying with sustainable growth is that we need to change our view, our view of growth, and we need to change the way we uh, we see about the growth and how growth is done. Well, we then need also to to diversify uh, uh, the ones uh, taking part of our programs and our initiatives. Um, we also try to develop tools uh, and guidelines for. Uh, how we evaluate projects or how we develop programs and that is a really tricky area because it's very easy to go back into it's like okay so we should try to diminish the bad parts of, of, of this but instead of trying to have more in a sort of forward-looking and, and uh, proactive approach I think that's a sort of great uh, challenge in that area and then we can also speak about targeted measures we have specific programs for example for social entrepreneurs or we've got programs for clean tech or we've got programs for um, supporting cooperatives and so on. Uh, the thing is, I would say, it's not an objective in itself to have loads of specific measures or specific targeted programs. It would be more interesting if we could actually have this on a general level uh, and could say uh, it is integrated within the agency. I would say it's not at the moment. Um, and I think it will take some time to, to get there. But still, again, we're trying to work both ways for that. Really? Yeah, I'm actually going to say, I'm going to stop there, you see. <laughs> okay, cool. So, I don't know if there are any questions right now. Um, yeah. Do you only work with sustainable growth? Um, as an agency, we work with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and regional development. So, we've got this sort of development part of it. But then again, um, we work with growth. So we work with this sort of um, a focus on how business is done and so on. So that's why we have this sort of economic focus on it. Um, but also we need to take into consideration what's happening in sustainable development. And I would say some of the, uh, um, some of the uh, parts that I showed here about circular economy and so on, those are parts of what also people in the sustainable development would identify as, uh, as being that. And for us it's more about identifying that as also being part of more sustainable economy. Okay, thank you. I guess we are going to leave some room for uh, more standard. And then, uh, <laughs> and then we'll open up for some questions for both uh, speakers.
in sustainability. It's, um, it's a great thing. Um, this is, um, we've been uh, teaching people sustainability for some decades here. We've had some 30, 40 people who've come and done PhDs uh, from developing countries. Was I supposed to speak English or Swedish? English. English, okay. <laughs> so I'm doing well so far. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, uh, I've went with one of my Chinese uh, students uh, to uh, he, to show him, he wants to show me uh, his, the village he came from. Uh, I'd taken him to the village where my wife lives here in Sweden, so you know, it was kind of a personal exchange. And, and when he was going to show me his home, but he said, first, the most important thing to show you is my schools. He took me to four schools, the four schools he'd attended. And each school, there was a program, and all the teachers lined up, and I was, this took several days. It was very exciting. This was the school where he started his career. So when he was, um, and surprisingly enough, I don't know, it seems strange, it was the same teacher. So we were in the classroom. He was in this classroom. And he said he was lucky. He had a young teacher who was well educated. And, uh, you know, there was in, in China, after the Cultural Revolution, there was quite a, a lack of teachers uh, for, for some decade or so. He got a good teacher. And uh, without that, he wouldn't have been here and done a PhD. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. I, I'm sure it's, it's not a big risk to say that he's faster at math than anybody in this room. Um, and this is where he started. I, I asked these guys a question, uh, and you could see the enthusiasm to, to answer. In China, in the last 20 years, 30 years or more, uh, hundreds of millions of people have uh, been lived out of poverty. And uh, to go to another place here, this is a guy in Ethiopia. He's not going to school. He makes bricks all day. He puts mud in this form. He lets this dry. Then he's put into that kiln. The kiln is a big chimney, basically, where these bricks are. Uh, are made into uh, bricks, <laughs> into hardened bricks. Uh, the fuel for this is old rubber tires, rubbish, all kinds of stuff. That's why there's a lot of nasty smoke coming out of it. Now the question is, um, don't we want these, don't, aren't we happy that the Chinese basically got a better living, that there are Chinese people going to school and getting PhDs abroad and uh, and uh, building nice houses with solar water power on their on their roofs, so that their old parents can get a hot shower. And don't we want this guy in Ethiopia to uh, see some future as well? Don't these people deserve some growth, basically? What is it we don't want to give? I mean, wouldn't we want houses for these people? Clothes, food. That is growth. So I think we have to be careful when we're anti-gross. I added that now. <laughs> uh, this was the original start of the lecture, and uh, the more conventional what is the one plan thing about uh, sustainable development is development that needs the need of the present without compromising the future. Now, 
the, the idea of <coughs> development, I think, is, is something to do with time. It's, it's a, a concept there is a lot of confusion about. Development, uh, like Utwechling in Swedish, is basically something that changes over time. So you can see that in a purely descriptive way. Um, the development of a plant, the development of the child's brain, the development of this. This means a change over time. It doesn't necessarily mean that things get better or bigger. But of course, that's the normative uh, sense of the word. We want things to get better over time and not worse. Okay. So there are two key concepts in there. One is needs, the needs, and particularly the needs of the poor. There's a um, the strong moral argument for caring more about the poor than about the rich. On the other hand, it is the rich who run the world. It's difficult to cross their interests uh, without a lot of causing a lot of trouble and a lot of conflict and a lot of resistance. So the poor need growth, and we all understand that. The rich typically want growth as well. And um, then there are limitations. There are limitations uh, because it's a finite world. I think that's why you all said we can't grow. Okay, it's simple mathematics. If you've got a finite surface, things can't grow. Uh, bacteria, for instance. If I put my, you know, a lunch or lunch plate here, it's dirty. The bacteria will grow like this, and then after 12 hours or 15 hours, something they will stop growing because there's no food there. So in that sense, you sort of think that growth can't go on forever. But we need to be a little uh, careful about what we mean by growth. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's become very um, <coughs> popular. People are beginning to see another essential part of the sustainable development is to see the whole world as one. That's, in that sense, there are boundaries. Man has been hurting against various boundaries for, for, for centuries when, when the best land ran out, for instance, and people moved to the United States and then they moved west. Eventually, they got the Pacific Ocean. Um, now we are running up against planetary boundaries. The most important and most discussed of these at the moment is the capacity of the atmosphere to hold carbon dioxide without uh, the planet getting warmer with very nasty consequences. If we have time, I'll talk more about that. Um, but still, we should stay for a moment still with sustainable development. I think development is one thing that we want. We want things to not get worse over time, at least. Um, sustainable sort of means that it, things can go on for a long time. The word is often used for all kinds of things that are nice. That is, of course, we, now we want sustainable development, we want the thinking about sustainable development to um, permeate all areas of politics. But that doesn't mean that we should use the word sustainable development for anything. I work with environmental economics. That is all kinds of questions to do with the environment. I still think that the word sustainable development maybe should be kept for a certain category of, of, of things. I think it is something at a large scale, very important, and that actually risks, causes risks that we will not be able to continue on Earth in, in the way we are doing. Okay. So, you know, there are very many things that are important and nice uh, that we should be trying to do it might be wise to keep the word sustainable development for the important, crucial ones that will actually make life on Earth livable for hundreds and thousands of years. And um, you can say unfairness, for instance. Is that sustainable? Well, the, you know, it would be nice to say, no, 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 we don't want unfairness. And of course we don't want unfairness, but actually it seems that unfairness is quite sustainable. As far as I know, the world has always been unfair, uh, and um, the Roman Empire was certainly very unfair, and the British Empire too, and the current state of affairs is very unfair. It seems, you know. Now you can say that there are, there are particularly serious forms like slavery, dictatorship, 
<coughs> on that sustainable. Minor unfairness is perhaps, uh, you know, so, I don't know. Uh, I leave that as a thought. I, I want to say something about, something more about, uh, you know, growth. Because I, I really think that uh, the poor need growth and the rich ones. Um, and there seems to be a problem with resources. But on the other hand, human imagination is limitless. And growth is really a time derivative. It is like speed. So I think that the question is really not whether we can have growth. The question is what kind of growth? Speed is all right if we're going in the right direction. Speed is very bad if we're going the wrong direction. What's the likelihood that we will get to Rome uh, today? Well, it depends partly on our speed, but also on the direction. If we're going the wrong direction, the speed really doesn't ma matter. Um, and I think that direction is much more important than speed. So what I want to say is that some things can grow. There is no problem in having a uh, more and smaller phones. Well, there are some problems, but perhaps not unsolvable problems. Computer games is a great idea. We could have funnier computer games. Every year the computer games could be funnier, and um, you know, that would be growth. It's in fact, it's quite an important part of growth, it seems nowadays. It's really a major product. Um, we can't have uh, more cars, though. Uh, more cars and more gasoline and more uh, aluminium and more plastics and all this hurts against the planetary boundaries. But more computer games doesn't. Nicer concerts, funnier lectures. Uh, these things we could have more of. Uh, and I don't really see why we couldn't build reasonable housing in Africa with solar roofs. I mean, it's true that we will need some materials and some you know, energy to do this and all this, but surely that is something we must do. Uh, so I think we can have growth, and the trick is to make it sustainable. That's a matter of several things. First of all, there are some products we can't consume more of. Most people, when they got more income, they want red meat and fast cars. That is a really serious problem because uh, more red meat and more fast cars is a serious problem for the, for the planet. If we could somehow persuade people that when they get more, in, you know, but they need a decent house, right, decent clothes, and basic needs, and pension system, and insurances. And, uh, after that, uh, they. Um, they maybe can't all get fast cars and red meat, but maybe, um, you know, nice concerts and funny computer games. So we need to, we need to steer the direction of growth. And we need to steer the technology of producing things. So we can, we can all have more phones, but it depends on the technology, you know, what is in them. Uh, there are certain metals that we might run out of and certain things that are toxic and stuff that we need to avoid. So we need and energy. We need energy to run the phones. Now, if that's all going to be nuclear energy or fossil energy, then I think there are some serious sustainability problems there. But if it was solar energy, I don't think there's a problem. The sun, the radiation that hits the Earth's surface is uh, like 100,000 100, times bigger than you know the total amount of energy we're using currently. So <coughs> there is a lot of solar energy that isn't really a problem. So that was the growth part. <laughs> I can say something quickly, but there are some very serious planetary boundaries. And the most uh, important of them today, it, it seems, I mean, it's hard to know because I mean, the spread of, of tox man-made toxins is such a complicated problem that we don't even know how serious it is. There are hundreds of thousands of chem new chemicals and they interact with each other and, and with biology. We don't know how serious that problem is. Maybe it's the most serious problem. Um, otherwise, it's uh, no, the loss of biodiversity. We don't even know. We don't know the names of most of the species that disappear. We haven't discovered them before they're gone. We 
don't know how serious that is either. But probably the most serious problem today is, is climate change. Uh, here we have the, the concentration of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of the last three, four hundred thousand years. And look what just happened. Oh, I need to correct that. But, yeah. Yeah. You see, last time I made that diagram, uh, and between that last time and now, suddenly it jumped again. This is incredible. This is going so fast that the um, Al Gore, when he made his film, he, he uses a ladder, he climbs up a ladder. The vice president stays to illustrate how fast this is moving. This, uh, this change here, 50, that's in my, in fact, in less than my lifetime. It's, it's basically my adult lifetime, roughly since I've got children. 50 ppm. That's happened before in history a few times. It's typically taken like 10,000 years or something. Now this happens in like in a, in a half a lifetime. Um, what's the consequences of this? Well, one of the worst things is we don't know. It hasn't happened before. So we should stop. We should do something about this. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> Three minutes for climate change, two minutes for now. <laughs> um, uh, well, we have the ice lunch. Uh, yeah. I should say, two degrees warming, by the way, we, there's a lot to talk about two degrees warming. You have to understand that's, that's an average temperature. It would mean that it would be six degrees warmer in some places. Uh, for instance, India, which is already rather warm. So. To do it is not good, and um, Bangladesh will disappear, and parts of New York. This is last time I was there. I just lived in New York for two years. I just came back, and uh, I was a climate refugee uh, for a week. Our, our apartment was uninhabitable. It was completely dark. Army vehicles were driving around with, with big lights and just tried to sort of deter too much uh, robbing and stuff. Uh, half of you know, New York is kind of probably there. And uh, we, we got to stay with a friend in Harlem for a week that was very pleasant. So different. Um, we know that with rising temperature, we would have less growth in poor countries, more conflicts. Uh, what are we doing about this? The world? Not much, basically. Most, most of but politics so far has failed. We're not doing very much in many countries. Sweden has a high carbon tax. That's a, that's a nice exception. Uh, but there's very little else. There's one thing that is positive, really. One little thing. But, so it becomes quite a big thing. The cost of solar energy is going down very fast. The expansion of solar energy and of wind energy is very fast. One of the people who knows most about this, Thomas Bobay, said that he's been searching systematically the literature in all the countries of the world. He has never found a forecast for solar energy that has not been beaten by reality a few years later. It is just going faster than anybody can imagine, in spite of the fact that we're not doing anything good politically to encourage it. Imagine if we actually accept Germany, I should say. Germany is actually has a very nice politics on this, in this area. Maybe China does too. But in many countries, there's little uh, policy, and still it's growing very fast. So that's, that's lucky. Otherwise, I think this, poli this planet would be pretty fried. We're probably still going to have two and a half, three degrees warming instead of two, which would probably mean nine degrees in India. So I can just imagine the consequences. It's still going to be very tough. Thank you. So uh, we open up for some uh, questions to both uh, speakers. Uh, I can start off if nobody else wants to. Uh, Thomas, uh, you were uh, you were talking about when you started. You talked about uh, you were very emotional with uh, showing these children and uh, yeah, saying that these people deserve growth. Uh, 
do you think that there is a difference uh, in uh, industrialized countries, uh, the growth that we have uh, compared to the countries that that are developing, so to say, that maybe there can be a, a split between uh, industrial countries having a stable state or no growth uh, economy, while other the countries that are developing uh, can have a uh, growing economy until they reach a certain point in time where they can switch. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's um, people want growth in Sweden too. I mean, I'm not sure more mistaken, more maybe Greece and Spain or France. I mean, they want growth there too. Um, but in like in, in India, it's not negotiable. They want to grow. Uh, you know, you can't stop them. That's uh, and um, so um, I think the you know our best chance is to try to uh, uh, promote renewable sources of energy and uh, good sources of technology and cooperation. It's still you know even with with a massive uh, uh, deployment of renewable energy, it's, it's still a great challenge for the world. Because of course they're using they're using good technologies in some cases, but I mean they're also using some bad technologies. They're also building a lot of new coal power in France and in India and in China. And um, yeah. we need we also need to. I mean it's, it's true. It looks like we are anyway during a period when Europe was lower growth rates. It's quite natural. I think it's natural to imagine. It doesn't mean that there will be no growth, but it's important to uh, learn how to manage economies with, with lower growth rates. And it's important to uh, promote growth in, in sectors and technologies that are appropriate. We can have, we, we should be building lots of solar and wind power all over Europe. Uh, and so that's a, that's a sector that needs growth. And we need to be very careful about which technologies to use, which materials, and, and so forth, so we don't want to make too many mistakes. And there are other things we should be um, uh, trying to avoid growth and yeah, uh, wasteful and unhealthy sectors. We need rather strong policy instruments to do this. Things like taxes on carbon, possibly taxes on meat. That's right. More questions? Yes. Uh, to Johanna, uh, this concept of sustainable growth that you have, um, it's not only the Department of Nalis, Nalis Department, but there is that streamlined into other uh, ministries in Sweden as well. Oh, I'm struggling to streamline it within the agency. <laughs> so, um, I think sustainable growth is a concept and um, something that's used over all agencies. I think it's more or less in all the missions that goes out to the uh, uh, public agencies to say like yours to work for sustainable growth. There has been, I would say, zero ambition to actually uh, just go or explore what that actually means. Um, so this has been a way for us to sort of, okay, so we got sustainable, we, we say we, we work with sustainable growth, this is a way of actually making a bit more concrete, so like, what is it that we want to see in that case? Um, I, I don't see policies um, in this direction yet. And I don't see, I don't, there's no, I would say also from, 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 uh, from a, a political side, there's no uh, concrete uh, understanding of what sustainable growth would be like. And I, think that there's still an idea of just a diminishing growth, the negative aspects of growth, instead of seeing this as the, the sort of baseline for how the economy is to work. I think this is something Thomas said also. There are some areas that are to grow, but they are very little done to actually put effort into that and choose, choose to stay on growth. That's something different than just growth. Please <laughs> answer there. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. So how do we promote, uh, well, I mean, growth in areas where we actually would like to see growth instead of uh, growth in areas through which uses a lot of natural resources and uh, creates emissions? Do you like to see growth in service areas? Obviously, mm -hmm. 
if we want to keep growth economically. Yeah, I mean, there wouldn't be. Is there actually a limit to growth economically if if we don't use natural resources? I, no, I don't think. I mean, um, I, obviously. If you speak of really infinite time, you guys, but you can make the case that the, the, that the growth rates must fall to zero eventually, or, or you know, but um, we don't have infinite time. The solar system will not last forever, uh, but we still have. Hopefully, I mean, I think what you know, we're we're trying to avoid the, uh, a planetary catastrophe within the next hundred years. It would be nice if we could at least sort of look forward to something that is, that is sustainable for a few thousand years more. Uh, preferably tens of thousands, you know. and uh, as long as there is solar energy, which is so enormously abundant, uh, we can synthesize with with uh, with that energy. We can synthesize basically anything else we need. We can't, obviously, we can't have a, a completely wasteful use of uh, and growth in in, in the use of, of um, toxic materials, nor rare metals. And, and rare elements, but this is not really uh, typically a problem because there is a price mechanism. This is one of the good things about the economy that you don't see uh, a lot of wastage of gold, for instance, because it's expensive. Well, the same thing will happen to the uh, platinum and, and, and whatever they're called, other metals that are in catalytic converters and in solar cells. They will get more expensive and they will be replaced by cheaper materials. And this, so a combination of technical progress and, and uh, substitution of materials should make it possible for us to have a lot of energy from, from solar energy and with that energy to synthesize a lot of things. So, Using sensible technology, we avoid things that are toxic and so on. And we can still have uh, some growth in some areas for a lot, very long time. We just need to, you know, avoid the, the waste. I mean, I say just. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to fight against the coal industry, for instance, or the oil industry. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, we, we can't have more use of fossil fuels that can't grow. In fact, that has to be reduced by about eighty percent. Which is the opposite of growth, obviously. We can also see that some. You can also hear that some people say that this um, the issue of energy uh, will not so much be um, influenced by um, what we consider being sort of sustainable development. It's just that the price tag of the sort of fossil fuels will actually go up so much that that will create a crisis in itself, mm. and that's sort of and it could also be an incentive to actually put more money into sort of. Um, uh, renewable, the renewables. So it might be that the economy actually will work in, in sort of in its own uh, manner, just in, in, in an efficient way. But then again, I think there is much too much up to the companies and the market on its own. I think there could be a bit more sort of you know, we want this direction, and this is uh, sort of put a price tag, as you say, put a, put a price tag on certain things. Yeah, the market will work it for. For goods, where there is an ownership of the of the resource that is being used, um, and for minerals, that is typically the case. There is an owner of, of the minerals. We might not like the owner, but anyway, there is an owner, and the owner will make sure to get paid, and so there will be a price. And so then the market mechanism sort of works, maybe not perfectly, but it works. But for um, uh, toxins that are reduced into the atmosphere for uh, for the air in the atmosphere for the fish in the seas and for many other things there is no owner and the market mechanism doesn't work so we need a, a policy we need politics instead too and we can in fact one way of doing the policies is to sort of make uh, fake markets uh, like like for tradable permits and that kind of thing that's one way of doing it or you can use taxes. And obviously, I'm just to end that. I would say, coming from the agency that works with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, I would say there's a great need. Also, we can talk policies and despair over the lack of, of, of initiative on the political side. Um, we can speak about sort of the market mechanisms themselves. But what's really, really, really what I find is like hopeful in, in this whole thing is actually the people coming up with just brand new ideas on, on doing things and doing them a totally different way. And this is what people call like disruptive technologies and so on. We've got IT. We're not using half of that. Um, to build this with IT, for example. And I think for anyone uh, in here, um, 
I mean, you can start a company and just say, like, okay, what problem do I want to, 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 to solve? Or you can just take a job anywhere and just start with this issue as well. There are so many things to be done anywhere and everywhere. And um, I know I get the question sometimes, like, how do you get into work on sustainability? Well, there isn't a job description for that. You can actually do it wherever. Um, just apply it uh, in, in, in sort of your future career. With that said, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.